there's a pretty one, Ulysses. Hello Booktube, I'm Sean the Book Maniac. Welcome back to my channel. Today I have, you probably gasped when you saw that this was an hour-long video. It's not actually a video. This is an episode of a podcast, one of the best bookish podcasts out there, called Reading Envy. I've mentioned it several times since I started my channel. The host is Jenny, and she's a good bookish friend of mine. And I was a guest on this week's episode. It's my third time to be a guest on her podcast, Reading Envy, and I asked her permission and thought I would just upload it as an audio file here. Many of you probably already subscribe, and those of you who don't, you're probably more likely to just go subscribe and download it onto your iPod or whatever. How old am I that I even talk up reference iPods? Maybe some of you will want to just hit play and listen. It's completely audio except for this little video intro. And I talk about three books that I had recently read and loved. I've talked about all of them on this channel already. Jenny talks about three books that she has recently read and loved that are really interesting. I'm especially curious about that Icelandic novel, her first pick in the episode. So, have a listen, and please subscribe. And also, Jenny is always looking for new guests. You don't have to, obviously. I'm in Tokyo. She's in the deep south of the United States of America. It can be done by Skype or whatever. So check out her website below for information on how to contact her about being a guest. I'll also put links to my previous two appearances in which I was talking about books that maybe you haven't heard me talk about. But anyway, that's all. Please enjoy. Hi everyone, this is Jenny and I am in the corner of the Reading Envy Pub with a return guest. Very happy to have Sean Mooney back. Welcome back, Sean. Hi Jenny, it's so nice to be back. Yeah, and it's been a while since you've been here for a regular episode. That was back in May of last year, episode 86. If you want to go back and listen to it, it's the Queen of Bailing. I've been promoted to the Empress of Bailing. <laughs> <laughs> I think following your reviews, I would have to agree with that. <laughs> yeah, and then you were very nice and provided something for the 100th episode. And then again on episode 107, which was the reading goals episode. So that wasn't very long ago, um, since you're Canadian and you know about Canadian stuff. Yeah, I'm so excited that you'll be reading Canada this year. Yeah, although I didn't bring any today. Sorry. <laughs> It's okay. Neither did I, did I? No, I didn't either. <laughs> Poor Maybe Canada. we'll do that again. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Since we last talked to you, you've actually started a booktube channel of your own where you have been recording lots of videos about books and book mims and lots of things. I like have. That. Tell us about yeah. that. Well, thank you. I have. St I started it maybe in September, I guess. Okay. And since then, I've put up a hundred and some videos. So I've been pretty busy putting up several videos a week and book reviews. And one of the uh, one of the traditions on BookTube is to do a Friday reads where you just kind of weigh in with what you what you finished, what you've started, what you're reading. And I do that every Friday without fail. And People do monthly wrap-ups, and so I think I'm the only booktuber that does a monthly bail wrap-up. That uh, <laughs> <laughs> seems to be taking off. And uh, I've actually created a few, uh, t they're called tags, like just kind of themed videos where you answer questions or you do a certain thing or talk about books in a certain way. And I've created a couple of those that have become somewhat popular. So, yeah, I'm having a great time with it. I'm Sean the Book Maniac there. Oh, good. And I'll link to that. I have to admit, I have not been able to watch every video, but I watch the review ones for sure. Yeah, well, I'm having a good time. So we have books that we're going to talk about, and I think you're going to start? I am, and I'm going to start with a shocking choice. This will be the first time I've ever tried to talk about a book of poetry. Oh. I uh, have started reading poetry, and I really owe that to you, because you talk about poetry all the time, and other people on Litzy, and I've just started to dip my toe into the waters of all the poetry that's out there. Great. And when I try to talk about poetry on my <laughs> booktube channel, I, I realize when I go back to the editing or whatever, or when I go back and watch it, that my hands are just flying. I mean, I'm gesturing <laughs> this and that because I'm just trying to compensate for how, uh, how uh, inarticulate I feel. But I'm really enjoying reading more poetry. 
So last week, and I won't name her, but last week I was reading a collection of poetry by a poet from my neck of the woods, from Western Canada. And I remember thinking that she was this great poet when I was much, much younger. And now reading through her poetry, I just felt like there wasn't anything, not an image, not a turn of phrase, not a shift in the poem that resounded in me. Like it just wasn't speaking to me at all. And then I heard that this gay Vietnamese American poet, Ocean Vuong, had won the T.S. Eliot Prize just last week, which is a literary prize for poetry, for his debut collection of poetry. So that's what I'm going to talk about today. It's called Night Sky with Exit Wounds. I read the first poem of the book and almost fell on the floor. <laughs> it was so powerful. So I quickly finished up the other book because it just wasn't working for me at all. And now the, I'm reading, I've been reading these poems and they're so powerful and they just speak to me so deeply. So why don't I just start by reading the first poem, the one that almost made me fall on the floor. Please. And then I'll talk a little bit more about Ocean Vuong. This is called Threshold. In the body, where everything has a price, I was a beggar. On my knees, I watched through the keyhole, not the man showering, but the rain falling through him, guitar strings snapping over his globed shoulders. He was singing, which is why I remember it. His voice, it filled me to the core like a skeleton. Even my name knelt down inside me, asking to be spared. He was singing, it is all I remember. For in the body, where everything has a price, I was alive. I didn't know there was a better reason. That one morning, my father would stop, a dark colt paused in downpour, and listen for my clutched breath behind the door. I didn't know the cost of entering a song was to lose your way back. So I entered. So I lost. I lost it all with my eyes wide open. So just even reading it again, I just like it's just humming through my body. I'm not even sure I understand everything that's going on in this poem, but wow. So what is it that you really notice? My reading of it is that he is a small boy uh, peeping at his father having a shower through the keyhole. And it's kind of an awakening of his uh, precocious sexuality. And just these guitar strings snapping over his globed shoulders in the body where everything has a price, I was alive. So just that almost tonal awakening to who he is. Mm -hmm. And then father, a dark colt paused in downpour. That is such a strong image. I just Threshold is right. The title is Threshold. Mm. He's he's uh, on the other side of the door, but he's also t at a th big threshold in terms of his awareness of who he is and who he will become. Yeah, and then he brings back the concept of life at the end. Exactly. So when you are reading these poems, do you find yourself reading them out loud? Because I feel like some of the power in it is hearing it. I often do, but the, I haven't done this other than I read one on my booktube channel yesterday. But that is such an interesting question because I find that, yes, poetry is very much an oral experience for me, and I get more out of poetry when I hear the poet read it to me. But these are so powerful on the page, it didn't even occur to me to read them aloud to myself. Wow. And he does a lot with line breaks and the way it's set up on the page that is really fascinating. And so that adds a dimension as a written text. Yeah, I always feel like when the poet gives you spaces, it's like it helps you understand the rhythm of it without having to hear it. Yeah, that's such a, again, I'm reflecting on some of the poetry I've been reading recently that didn't speak to me. And I read it out aloud. And maybe sometimes that spoke to me more deeply. But the one that I was referring to that I won't mention her name, <laughs> even when I read it aloud, it didn't speak to me. So, yeah. So how about the other poems? Are they on similar themes or are they all about childhood or what are you finding? They are often about his dad. So he was born in 1988. So he's still a young guy uh, in Saigon on a rice farm just outside of the city. And by the age of two, he, the family had emigrated to Hartford, Connecticut. He is the only member of his extended family to become literate in any language. 
But he didn't learn to read English until he was 11. His dad went to prison soon after they got to America for domestic abuse, and many of his poems are about his dad. Hmm. This this one anecdote, I'm not sharing it for any kind of a jokey reason, but it's from the article about him in The New Yorker. His mom was, or is, a nail manicurist, and her English was broken. And one day she was talking to one of her customers and said she wanted to go to the beach. But because of her broken English, it sounded like bitch. So the customer said, you should just say you want to go to the ocean. Well, his mother didn't really know what an ocean was. But once she understood that it wasn't exactly the same as a beach and that it actually connected Vietnam with America, she renamed her son Ocean. So that's, that's how he got his name. That's a great story. He explores some of that in his poetry as well. But his poems are often about his father's post-traumatic stuff from living through Vietnam, the troubled times in Vietnam and then being a violent father and, and an absent father and about his sexual, about his own sexuality. And those are some of the main themes. Uh, Michiko Kakotani compares his poetry to Emily Dickinson's, which I thought was quite interesting. And I'd like to share just the ending of one other poem. The uh, title of the poem is almost as long as the excerpt I'm going to read. The title of this poem is, In Newport, I Watch My Father Lay His Cheek to a Beached Dolphin's Wet Back. Hmm. And these are the ending lines. And once more I am swinging open the passenger door. I am running toward a rusted horizon, running out of a country to run out of. I am chasing my father the way the dead chase after days. And although I am still too far to hear it, I can tell by the way his neck tilts to one side as if broken, that he is singing my favorite song to his empty hands. Yeah, so there's another one very much about his dad and interesting that the singing is in both of them. So there's an element of, of song in, in these poems as well. This is definitely one I need to read. <laughs> I really want you to read it and then tell me what it all means, Jenny, but I'm just <laughs> loving it so much. I mean, you know, I, I'm often rash in the decisions and the pronouncements that I make, so I hereby make this rash pronouncement. Ocean Vuong is my favorite poet. Good. I absolutely love these poems. And now you can look for another favorite. <laughs> Right. I'm just right. glad you're reading poetry. I I always feel weird about talking about it, actually, and I'm surprised to hear you say you think I talk about it frequently, which makes me happy, because I'm always worried that people have already maybe discarded poetry as an idea. Maybe they were forced to read it in school, or uh, they just feel like there's not a way in. And I've just found you just have to read a lot of it before you figure out what you like. Well, and the, the fact that you've talked about it as often as you have, and that it's it's just been kind of a hand-holding coaxing for me, and, and uh, you know, not only you, but primarily you, but, mm -hmm. you know, for example, Lindy on Litzy, yeah, uh, often at, uh, excerpts about it and, and rhapsodizes about poetry, and it, all of that has just gotten me to try, tip my toe in the water. Yeah, and this new generation of poets, like people who are younger than me, I think is the most impressive and promising batch actually yeah. that's where i've been finding my favorites recently that's awesome yeah. so that is ocean Wong. can't recommend his this one collection highly enough so what's your first pick okay so my first one is a really interesting book it's called woman at 1000 degrees by Hathgrimmer Helgeson, if I'm pronouncing it even close to right, from Iceland. It's translated Easy for you to say. <laughs> I've been practicing. It's yeah. translated by Brian Fitzgibbon. Although it's interesting because Hathgrimmer is a poet and an artist and a writer, and he seems to speak many, many languages. I guess if you're Icelandic, you've already learned the hardest language, so why not? And there's That's actually right. a video of him. Uh, reciting a poem that he wrote in English on the internet. So it's called Suit and Tie. I can recommend it. It's very um, commanding. It's about the uh -huh. financial crash in Iceland a year after it happened. So that's kind of interesting. He's an author I didn't know, which I find really disappointing because I spent a year trying to read Icelandic stuff and somehow never came across him. But he apparently has some earlier novels that have been translated into English and he's fairly well known. This one I actually got from the publisher, but it's already out. So I feel okay talking about it. 
And it's about this woman and she's dying. She lives in a garage. <laughs> I'm going to read wow. the first little bit just so you can get a sense of her. Maybe I'll do that first. I'm going to do that first. So this is actually the very first page or so. And it's called, the chapter is called 1929 Model. And it's in 2009. I live here alone in a garage together with a laptop computer and an old hand grenade. It's pretty cozy. My bed is a hospital bed, and I don't need any other furniture except for the toilet, which is a real drag to use. It's such a long way to travel all along the bed, and then the same distance, again, over to the corner. I call it my Via Dolorosa, and I have to totter across it three times a day, like any other rheumatic ghost. My dream is to be hooked up to a catheter and a bedpan, but my application got stuck in the system. There's constipation everywhere. There aren't many windows here, but the world appears to me through my computer screen. Emails come and go, and good old Facebook just keeps on going like life itself. Glaciers melt, presidents darken, and people lament the loss of cars and houses. But the future awaits at the end of the baggage claim carousel, slant-eyed and smirking. Oh yes, I follow it all from my old white bed, where I languish like a useless corpse, waiting to die or to be given a life-prolonging injection. They look in on me twice a day, the girls from the Reykjavik Home Care Services. The morning shift is a real darling, but the afternoon hag has cold hands and bad breath and empties the ashtray with a vacant air. Oh my god, I wanted to interrupt you about a, uh, ten times. Just uh, amazing, that opening line. I know. Oh, and... that's so brilliant. I was just trying not to laugh into the microphone. I know, and I was just immediately interested in this character and oh it, my goes, God. <laughs> it goes against all the things i say that i don't like because you know i don't like the doddering old characters and she probably qualifies but i was still really in love with her from the beginning and she's not particularly likable like she's she's really kind of rude to her staff and um, there's just these two nurses that visit her basically and she she learns how to use the internet and gets training on how to be a hacker hacks into her daughter-in-law's email <laughs> Oh my God. <laughs> it's, and so there's all these funny things that happen in the present day. But then she's also telling a story about her life. And she grew up in Iceland in World War II. And so she came of age during World War II. And okay. her father fought for the Nazis. And her mother, back then, Iceland was um, part of Denmark. Denmark yeah. was under Nazi occupation. But the island of Iceland was occupied by the British. Wow. And so it's something I didn't know anything about. I didn't know that. No. Just fascinating situation. Uh, she has to move uh, to Denmark uh, with her mother to go to school, but then she gets sent off to the countryside in Denmark and she's supposed to meet back up with her family in this train station and it doesn't happen. And then she has to fend for herself in this war landscape. It's crazy what happens. And all along mm -hmm. she has this hand grenade <laughs> that her father gave her to help keep her safe. And it's just, I, I felt like I learned a lot, but I laughed a lot. And the way it's told is very smart because it goes back and forth between 2009 and these other times. Um, so I really enjoyed it. I kind of, oh my God, I, w I want to read it immediately. Yeah, it was so much better than I think I would have expected just from reading the description. Um, it Must was a lot more than... Translation. Oh, yeah. So, translation's just, it's so crisp. Yeah. I feel like he must have really captured that really well. And, you know, Icelandic is not an easy language to really wrap your head around. So I feel like I should give the translator an award. It's so peppy, you know, like you were saying, it's snappy or crisp. Um, peppy is the great word. Yeah. Yeah. So you keep, it keeps you reading, I think. And in, I don't really read a lot of historical fiction, but the way it's told and because of the way it's told, I was. I was completely into it every minute. So I have to give it to it for that because I don't usually finish World War II novels. And don't you just love it when you encounter a book that uh, goes against all of your preconceived notions about what kind of book you'd like? I know. I love when that happens. I just Fantastic. haven't stopped thinking about this character either. She's so funny. You just picture her like parked in this garage in her hospital bed. Based on page one, I'm not going to forget about her anytime soon. Yeah. I guess the only other thing I'll say is I'm going to be looking up this guy's other novel now because I don't think I'm done with him. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I can't wait for the show notes to be published so that I can look him up myself because there's no way that I'll be able to figure out how to spell his name. 
until your show notes go up. But oh, that book, that novel sounds amazing. Yeah. So what is the second book you want to talk about today? I want to talk about a book of short stories out of the UK published last year. Are you familiar, Jenny, with the Republic of Consciousness Prize? Yes. I read half the shortlist last year. Okay, well, this is on the short list this year. Awesome. And it's, uh, for the, your listeners, it's a prize for small presses, and it rewards, and I'll quote exactly, hardcore literary fiction and gorgeous prose. Well, that describes my reading taste to a T. <laughs> yeah, it does. And the small presses, to be eligible for the award, the presses must have a maximum of five employees. Wow. Now, it's, it was created and administered by a booktuber. His name is Neil Griffiths, and he's also a novelist. And he created this prize just a few years ago, I think. Mm-hmm. And his uh, new novel is getting lots of buzz. It's called As a God Might Be. I'm hoping to read it next month. Anyway, this is a collection of short stories by a British, young British writer. Her name is Ellie Williams, and the title of the collection is A Trib. Period. So it's the abbreviation for attribution, I guess. But I checked on her video and she pronounces it attrib. So we'll go with that. These stories are wonderful and unique. I guess I've heard them described as microfiction. So she takes a very small, seemingly innocuous moment and spins, or maybe the best verb is on spools, these playful, metaphysical, light stories that are full of linguistic play and emotional dipsy doodles are usually about breakups or she doesn't love me as much as I do or I want to kiss her type (laughs) of dramas. But all of this rich, patterned disarray, I just love them. So let me just talk about a couple of the stories and then read you the opening to one. Uh, one of her stories is called Platform, and in this piece, there's a a woman who is still nursing her broken heart, or maybe a year later after a breakup. She had said goodbye to her lover in a train station and had taken a picture of her as she was leaving her forever, blown it up poster size on the wall, and finally, months and months after Staring at the picture, she notices it in the background of the photo, across the tracks, there's a businessman who, because of a gust of wind, his toupee has blown off his his head and is uh, careening towards another man's face. And that her photo has caught this moment. And it, because she had been so heartbroken all this time, she only just noticed it. Well, that gives you maybe an idea of the kind of playfulness that... Uh, Uh, these stories uh, narrate. Another one's called Swatch, about two 12-year-old boys. During a hide-and-seek game, they're hiding in a cupboard, and the one has convinced the other to stuff as many marshmallows into his cheek as possible while singing the school song, and it ends up becoming a profound meditation on the deep communication between uh, of eye contact the title story is called a trip and it's about a foley artist you probably know what that is i didn't but a foley artist is like a sound effects person who creates sound effects to be added to film and video after the fact and in this story she is looking for the perfect sound effect to simulate the creation of eve out of adam's rib My favorite story is called Smote. The full title is Smote, or When I Find I Cannot Kiss You in Front of a Print by Bridget Riley. And it's about two women standing in front of a print by Bridget Riley. And the the narrator wants to kiss her lover, but she feels for all kinds of reasons that she just can't bring herself to. And it is just a trip and a half. Now, I got confused in that story, and then I Googled the print by Bridget Riley, and then it became this really rich experience. It's a wonderful story. And I'm going to read you the introduction to her story, Bees. The spelling is capital B, small s, Bees. I was awake for three reasons. One, you lived near a tube stop, and it was firing up for the first journey of the day. Two, there's a bird in the tree outside your window, and it was shouting at your house. I don't know what kind of bird it was, nor the type of tree. 
Thirdly, you had trapped a bee in a glass last night and forgotten to let it out. The intention was clearly there, to transport it down the stairs or tip it out of the window, and you had slid a postcard of Vienna or St. Petersburg or that sort of place beneath the tumbler in readiness. It was not actually a tumbler at all, but a washed-out jar of Nutella, and the bee was drunk on a whole night's worth of staring at the sights of Vienna or St. Petersburg and the city's ghosts of hazelnuts and sugar, dink -da dink dinking its head against the transparent wall on your bedside table. Trapped beneath your arm, I blinked at the bee. Bees can see in UV light, so we must have looked like a ridiculous disco last night. It headbanged in answer to this thought, eyes all honeycombed and asterisk star kaleidoscopic, while outside the bird shouted a little louder. I'm sure there is an identification app that allows you to run through an index of birds' topatas and skirtsos and bugle blurts. As you thumb down the list, little facts about birds might run in a scrolling marquee along the bottom of your screen. The bones of a pigeon weigh less than its feathers. That kind of thing. Starlings only exist in America because a man wanted to introduce all the birds mentioned in Shakespeare's plays to the continent. The organ in a bird's throat that allows it to sing is called a syrinx. I test this word now between my teeth and feel it is far sprightlier and more lovely a word than larynx. This was a good call on the anatomist's part. You stir, as I say, larynx aloud, and turn a little, causing crow feet folds in your pillow around your head. Sleepily, I wonder whether there could be an equivalent app for identifying bees by their song before remembering that they do not sing. Not for us, anyway. They dance. I make a note to look up bee facts later in the day for balance's sake. Just yesterday, I read a study that found older honeybees effectively reverse brain aging when they take on those nest responsibilities that are typically handled by much younger bees. Bee brain, I say, softly, out loud, and the crow feet of your pillow deepen imperceptibly. That gives you a sense of, again, the, the wordplay and the playfulness and the... Uh, microfictionality of her stories just love them yeah it's microfiction but it also in one story travels quite far from like idea That's to so idea far. yeah exactly exactly hmm. and uh often just in a kind of an etymological way even ruminating on the letters of the alphabet and what their shapes in uh, cause her to think of and she can spin a whole story out of that well, I'm a big fan yeah. of using second person too. Well, um, I think this is the Jenny book. Yeah. Well, I've noticed this book because of the cover. It has a very striking yep. cover. So I've kind of been like, hmm, what are you? So I hope it wins the prize because it certainly uh, did a number on my consciousness. <laughs> yeah, it was interesting looking at the list last year because they had some short story collections and some novels. And I feel like those two things are hard to compare. They sure are. Yeah. Maybe yeah. they'll eventually split it into two prizes or something. Interesting. Oh, and by the way, Ellie Williams uh, this last year also had a book of poetry out, which I have not mm. checked out yet. But you can tell, can't you, in the way she writes. I feel like you oh, can for sure. tell a poet. Yeah. yeah. It's awesome. Exactly. Thank you. I'm so glad okay. to hear about it because I haven't, I don't think I've read any reviews of it or anything. So I really liked hearing about it. A difficult book to talk about, but I knew that this was a book I wanted to t tell you about because, yeah, this is, this is a Jenny book. Yeah, definitely. What's your next pick? Okay, well, my next pick is – it's actually a book that has a novella and two short stories in it. So I don't really know what to call that, but I'm only going to talk about the novella, which is mm -hmm. The Wind Off the Small Isles by Mary Stewart. And ah. <laughs> I wish I could remember why I decided to buy a Mary Stewart book randomly off of Book Depository one day. I <laughs> I can't remember if that's why I went there. And you know how you get down the rabbit hole of some of these book sites and Book Depository, it's like free shipping, but you never know when it's going to show up because it's coming across the ocean. And I think I ended up looking at like modern classics, like pretty editions that were under a certain amount of 
dollars. And then I just bought this one book. So randomly this one day, this one book <laughs> arrived, but I, I just can't remember why I got it. But that aside, <laughs> this year, one of my goals is to read more of the books that I already own. Uh, yes. This is a small one. And I decided, well, I'm going to read you book. And so I picked it up and read it. I guess Mary Stewart, it's the same Mary Stewart that wrote the Merlin books that I think are better known. I'm trying to find like the Crystal Cave and books like that, which I don't believe I've ever read, but I definitely know about them. This is more um, representative of, a, I guess, a genre that she kind of helped create, which is referred to in her obituary as romantic suspense. <laughs> she just died recently, didn't she? Yeah, 2016. She died on, um, she lived in Loch Awe in Scotland when she passed away. So she lived almost 100 years, which is incredible. That's what um, I thought. Yeah. Yeah. And this book came out, or this novella is from 1968, but it was long lost and just recently republished. So, but it's a character that shows up often in her shorter fiction. Her name is Perdita West, and she's mm. spunky. <laughs> So mm. her her female characters don't necessarily need men to take care of them. They're smart. They drive their own cars. They go on adventures. They're quite precocious and well-read. <laughs> mm. So I liked that about them. Yeah. And so in this novel, it actually starts in 1879 in Lanzarote, which is in the Canary Islands. That's kind of the Americanized Spanish version of that island. And wow. you just read this really brief two pages about a young woman who lives with a in her with her family and they're very wealthy and she elopes with a fisherman and then the story ends and then it picks up with perdita west who's a secretary to a famous author and they're visiting this island and the author thinks she might want to live there because every time she writes a new pirate swashbuckling novel adventure novel they she goes to the place where the novel is set so they might be stuck in the Canary Islands for a while. And so, you know, there's a mild adventure that that happens. And people refer to it as romantic suspense. I would say it's very little romance and very little suspense. It's rather like an afternoon picnic adventure type of <laughs> level. It's not scary. It's not um, passionate. It, they have tea and picnics and talk about books. But I like cozy it anyway. suspense. <laughs> yeah, cozy it's suspense. Very cozy. <laughs> this not novella, more than anything, has driven me to the craziest ends of the internet because they mm. mention in passing that the farm that they're they're looking at, this house where the, these wealthy landowners used to live, and it's been abandoned for about a hundred years. They grew. They had a pick a prickly pear farm. <laughs> <laughs> a prickly pear farm. A prickly pear farm. Not for the prickly pear, but because of the bug that is attracted to the prickly pear, which is the cochineal. And that's what they make a lot of red dye out of. And wow. so apparently, still today, you can look at a box of jello and it might say cochineal uh, coloring or something like that. Those are bugs, dead bugs, dried bugs, ground up into red. Red dye. <laughs> And so well, I started looking at these videos of this, like this woman in Mexico who dyes her wool using these bugs. Anyway, long, long story. So there's all these little the rabbit hole. Yeah. But I think it's because Mary Stewart herself is a very curious person. So she makes her characters curious and they encounter crazy adventures because of their curiosity. So it, it was almost like a grown up uh, Nancy Drew, or you know, we're, they just stumble across these things. Except for maybe the stakes aren't quite as high. <laughs> I read uh, several Mary Stewart novels about which I remember nothing really when I was a teenager. Her, I don't think she wrote for for you know young adults, but uh, I read them when I was young and enjoyed them. But I don't remember yeah. much. I would say they'd probably be pretty accessible to young adults because they're short yeah. and pleasant and yeah. Mm -hmm. So I don't have much more to say about it. I wish I could remember why I went after it in the first place, but <laughs> I have it's read it and it was good. <laughs> the, the rabbit holes, uh, sometimes they're worth half the, half the experience, eh? Yeah. So how about you for your and, last book? Yeah, well, my last book is uh, not quite as much of a backlist as yours, but somewhat. This is a 1994 novel. It's called Who Will Run the Frog Hospital by Laurie Moore published in 1994. 
this was her second novel, and it's the first of uh, it's the first book of hers that I've ever read. And I read it uh, just it was one of the last books I read in 2017. This is a short little novella. It's about 100 pages, I think. And the uh, protagonist is a woman called Barry, B-E-R-I-E. And as the novel opens, she's in Paris on an ill-fated holiday with her philandering husband. And uh, their marriage is on its last legs. I think on page two, she says, I feel his lack of love for me, but we are managing. (laughs) (laughs) So... Uh, she's at a crossroads in her life. Should she stay or should she go? And she's probably in her late thirties. Barry is at that time. And uh, she remembers back to when she was 15 years old in 1972, living in an upstate New York town called horse hearts. And her best friend was a girl named Sills. So we got Barry and we got Sills. And they worked together at this ridiculous theme park called Storyland, a kind of fairy tale themed park. And Sills, who was beautiful and very precociously sexual, she looked 20. And Barry, the same age, 15, looked 12. Hmm. Um, And Sills, her job at the theme park is she's Cinderella and she gives children's rides in her pumpkin coach. Barry, and dressed in a frumpy pinafore and funny hat, she works the cash register. But they become best friends and they sneak out for illicit smoke breaks and they party at night and get into all kinds of mischief. Sills did a painting in the, in the story. Sills has done a painting of herself and Barry with a bunch of frogs that are bandaged. And in fact, this is to commemorate the fact that they would try to save frogs. The boys in the town would take their BB guns out and try to and shoot frogs, and um, Sills and Barry would go out and try to administer first aid to the wounded frogs, which didn't usually end up being much help. And Sills has painted this painting to commemorate that, and that's uh, who will run the frog hospital. Lori Moore was already writing this novel when she wandered into an art gallery and saw that painting and bought it and then brought it into her story. So that's pretty interesting. Oh, fine. Sills gets into trouble. I'm not going to do any spoilers. Sills gets into trouble and Barry commits a small crime to help Sills and she gets caught and there are repercussions. That's all I will say. Uh, as an as an uh, adult in her late 30s, Barry looks back on this time and that friendship with a lot of kind of bittersweet longing that it was at a time when she felt like she mattered or that she had a relationship that actually was real and, uh, you know, casting her current marital problems in, uh, you know, in sharp relief. This is, I would say... <laughs> Uh, this is a kind of a Proustian novel, but not too Proustian. I don't like my Proustianism as Proustian as Proust. Right. <laughs> it's too much, too much. But there's just, it's a really meditative uh, novel uh, focused on, you know, meditating on memory, being young, having the future wide open, and then also how all that kind of starts to dwindle and shut down in middle aged. And uh, I thought the writing was just beautiful. So let me read a couple very short paragraphs. This is her looking back at that time. My childhood had no narrative. It was all just a combination of air and no air. Waiting for life to happen, the body to get big, the mind to grow fearless. There were no stories, no ideas, not really, not yet. Just things unearthed from elsewhere and propped up later to help the mind get around. At the time, however, it was liquid, like a song. Nothing much. It was just a space with some people in it. When So she's in her late 30s now, but uh, about a decade before, she had gone back to a reunion in her hometown and Sills is still there and nothing much has happened to her since she was 15 and they just don't connect at all. It's just, you know, the the friendship doesn't survive. And as she leaves to go back to her life in the big city, she writes this or she says this, she thinks this. Well, she says this, 
I cried for everyone and for all the scrabbly funny love one sent out into the world, like some hit song that enters space and bounds off to another galaxy, a tune so pretty you think the words are true. You do. There was never any containing a song like that, keeping it. It went off and out, speeding out of earshot or imagining or any reach at all, like a rocket invented in sleep. Now that, I think, is my favorite passage of the novella. It just gets to me, and I don't know how to say what it brings up, but it just, past is just, you, you can remember it, you can think back on it, but it's gone. And there's a kind of sadness about it, that when you get into middle age, that uh, that passage nails for me. So I love this novel. This was a five-star read for me, and it's made me want to read more by Laurie Moore. <laughs> so what's your last pick? Well, you know, I'm going to talk about a book that's been talked about on the podcast before, and I always tell people that that's okay. So I'm going to follow my own rules. Because I, I always want people to talk about the best three books they've read recently. And this is one of mine. So <laughs> I didn't want to talk about something that was only a three star read. So I'm going to talk about a book you talked about on episode 86. And that is Idaho by Emily Yay! Ruskovich. <laughs> I'm so glad you liked it. Yeah. And so I've been following this book, it feels like, since the time that you brought it. Because I feel like that was the first time I really had heard about it, heard someone discuss it. And then since then, I feel like every podcaster and blogger and reviewer was, was over the moon about the book. And then it ended up on the Tournament of Books shortlist. So I thought, okay, well, now I'm going to finally read it. I mean, I'd already included it on the list of books I wish I'd gotten to in 2017 and didn't. So I knew it was looming for me. But this really interesting thing has happened. And there's a Goodreads group just for Tournament of Books, and people are discussing each individual title on the shortlist. And I would say that the majority of the people talking about Idaho are not liking it. And I finally asked them, I was like, look, I don't understand what's happening. All the reviews last year were good. So why does everyone not like it now? <laughs> huh. And I think most of the people are going into it, expecting the crime to be solved. There's a crime that happens. Yeah. And that's not the novel that it is. And they just can't get past it. It's because their expectations are wrong. <laughs> and so I'm going to say a little bit more about it than I think you really did, because you really wanted everyone to experience it for themselves. And I think that's still a really good idea, because the way the novel unfolds is absolutely part of it. Right. But you have these two people who are married, and their names are Anne and Wade. Yeah. And they live in Idaho. And Wade is losing his memory and Anne doesn't know everything about the life that happened before. And she can find clues in different places. Sometimes she stumbles across things because Wade gets very angry at her and she doesn't know what she's done exactly, except for she can tell it must connect to something from before. So she has this puzzle that she doesn't know what to do with. I mean, she's heard things in the town and everything and she does funny things like, Okay, I have to read. I'm going to read this <laughs> this one scene that I think is probably the moment where I was like, "Oh, hmm," and it really got me hooked into the book, which is probably not the same scene as for everyone else because I'm weird. Right. Um, <laughs> but I think eventually what happens is there's this this number of characters that are throughout the novel, and it it moves around in time, and you basically just kind of get to know the people that are connected to this story and you see their lives. And I had this profound discussion with someone. I don't know if it was in Goodreads or Instagram. I think it was on Instagram. I just have to say people have profound discussions on Instagram. Who knew? Yeah. You know, there's all these book people on Instagram too, not just yeah, YouTube. Wow. Just kidding. wow. Wow. <laughs> well, cause I think I was still trying to sort my feelings out about the book. Like what is it that I, that I'm connecting to so much. And I, I was kind of saying, I think maybe it's because I like novels about small lives and people just kind of having their life and how profound that can sometimes be. And you do see a lot of their lives. And her response to me was something about, she thought that the book was about, does a person stay the same person even when bad things are happening to them? So is yeah. Wade still Wade when his memory is lost? Yeah. Is Jenny still Jenny, even though she ends up in prison? Yeah. Um, 
And I just thought, yeah, that's exactly what it is. So I'm quoting her again. I'll link to her review <laughs> because I felt like, yeah, that explains it. I mean, it's precisely, there's even a, a character in here who's kind of on the periphery and he uh, loses a leg because of an accident. And it's right. the same question for him, I think. And uh, I found it to and be very meaningful. And I got oh, to the so end and I, I really just felt like it had been a great read. I love the ending. And I would echo what you said. I mean, for me, it was with all of the the, the crime and the, the horrendous violence and you know, the drama, really, this was a, a story about witnessing and loving and hum- uh, being being kind. Yeah. And yeah. I just picked up, I have the book from the public library and I'm noticing that they have a mystery sticker on the spine and then surely doing no. that kind of thing is not helping. <laughs> and no. I actually think this has the most in common with a book that I read last year that was on the man booker prize long list. And it had the same kind of issue where it was being pitched as a crime novel, but wasn't. And that's reservoir 13 by John McGregor. And it was much more about the lives of people as they kind of spiraled out past this event that had happened and the way nature moves on and the way people move on. And uh, there's a lot of similarities between those two novels, I think. You are right. And I'd never made that connection. I haven't read the McGregor yet, but it's on my list. But now that's a great comparison. Yeah. And that one really takes some patience. This one at least is written more like a crime novel would be where there's fast moving parts and there's small sections and they move around in time. And so that keeps you reading too, I think. Okay. I'm going to read you the page that (laughs) made me fall in love with the book. The Sage Hill women's correctional center in Southwestern Idaho has a small library of donated books. The librarian is named Claire. Anne has spoken to her on the phone five times in the last six years. Claire's voice is like her name, which is like a knife blade, sharp, competent, and shining. The temptation to call the prison library is always at its worst when Anne has just been inside the truck. Her two secrets, sitting in the truck, calling the prison, are so closely tied to each other in her mind that now... When she is back in the house, sitting in front of the fire she's just made with logs she's gathered from the woodshed, she feels once again that familiar beckoning. And I think this is when I was like, oh, what? Why is she doing that? Yes, yes. I remember having a similar reaction to that passage and realizing that just there were so many turns in that novel that I thought, oh, that's what kind of book this is. And then, you know. 20 pages like, oh no it's not that kind of book at all it's this kind of book and you know by the end it was like yeah this is a book about human kindness and empathy yeah it kept changing i'm so pleased that you enjoyed it because i loved it and i guess uh, what you're really trying to say is that i'm a trendsetter that's absolutely <laughs> right you knew it was good before all these other people started that's putting right. it on lists <laughs> yeah i'm gonna rename my channel sean the trendsetting book maniac <laughs> What is it, no, Tastemaker? The Tastemaker. <laughs> but yeah, I, I can't wait. That's her debut novel. I know. I cannot wait to see what uh, Ruskovich comes out with next. Tough act to follow. I was aware that the, uh, the, the people that didn't like it, they didn't like it because what you said or uh, what I was picking up was – it's not explained why did this crime happen, right? <laughs> right? And I was okay with that. Because the characters don't know. Nobody why, knows. Why should A lot know? of things that happen in life, we don't know why. Right. But I was totally fine with that. But it was just such a rich reading experience. There's a lot of good things in there. So much. So tell me what you're excited about reading next or that you've already started Sure, yeah. I've started a couple books just in the last day or so. Uh, One is Hot Off the Press. It's the posthumous collection of short stories by Dennis Johnson, The Largesse of the Sea Maiden. And I'm only partway into the first story, but he certainly grabbed my attention right off the bat. I loved his debut collection of short stories, Jesus' Son, which I read uh, just after he died and just powerful so i'm really excited to be reading these and sad that this will be the last from him Mm. and i have also started my very first louise erdrick novel the roundhouse and it's starting out very 
very well as well. I'm planning to, the next book that I read, hopefully next week I'll have a chance to start it, is a debut by a writer, an American writer named Patty Yumi Cottrell. And the title is Sorry to Disrupt the Peace. And uh, she is a uh, mixed race writer. And this novel sounds really heavy, but apparently it's not only heavy. Uh, the protagonist is receives the news in the opening chapters that her adoptive brother or half-brother, stepbrother, somebody has committed suicide. And then it goes from there. But apparently it's not as heavy as that sounds. Very, very much looking forward to it. How about yourself? Well, first I wanted to say that I, yeah. that Sorry to Disrupt the Peace, I believe, was it a book of the month title, maybe? Or that people I don't know. talking about it a lot, and then I felt like it had a resurgence. People started talking about it a lot again, and so it's made me, it's piqued my curiosity anyway. So I'll look Jeez. forward to your review of that one. Mm-hmm. For me, I have two more books I'm hoping to read from the Tournament of Books shortlist, but one of them I own, so I'm not going to mention it because I've still never gotten to it, and I've brought it up more than once. <laughs> but the one I have from the library I need to read is The Animators by Kayla Ray Whitaker. No right. idea what it's about, but I've heard it's good. So I have too. So I canceled my book of the month, and I canceled my Malaprop subscription, and now I'm trying a few new things this year for book subscriptions. Oh. And so I have the Restless Books Book Club, which is um, it's an independent small press they I do a lot of translated books, um, but not all translated. And uh, so I got my first two books from them the other day. And so I really want to start in on Heartland by Anna Simo. I don't quite know how you say her name, but it's described as a madcap dystopia. But even reading the author bio, I'm so intrigued. She was, tell me that this person doesn't sound amazingly interesting. A New Yorker, most of her life, Anna Simo was born and raised in Cuba, Forced to leave the island during the political homophobic witch hunts of the late 1960s, she immigrated to France in time to witness the May 1968 revolt, study with Roland Barthes, and participate in early women's and gay lesbian rights groups. After moving to New York again, she became an English language playwright, journalist, and lesbian activist, co-founding Medusa's Revenge Theater, the direct action group The Lesbian Avengers, <laughs> the national cable program Dyke TV, and the groundbreaking online magazine The Gully, offering queer views on everything. <laughs> oh my god. I hope she's written her memoirs. I know. She sounds fascinating. So yeah. and Is she, she looks still around? Yeah. Looks like okay. it. They have this really great picture of her with white hair with a blue kind of mohawky front and a dinosaur t shirt. <laughs> Sounds amazing. Yeah. So I'm really looking forward to that. I was hoping I could zip through it in time for this uh, recording, but I could tell when I, I I started it, read the first few pages, it's just going to require a little more time and attention than that. So I'm going to give it what it deserves. Next time. Yep. All right. Well, thank you so much for coming back to Reading Envy, Sean. What a delight. Thank you for having me.